and welcome to the Donmar Warehouse's Climate Conversation series. My name is Claire Slater. I'm the Head of New Work at the Donmar and I am delighted to host this series of conversations between leading artists and leading climate and social justice thinkers. Our hope is that bringing these inspiring people together will help us all reconsider what it means to make theatre in the context of the climate crisis. These conversations have all been curated by Zoe Svensson. Zoe is a director and an academic in drama and performance at the University of Cambridge, and she's currently working as the Dolmar's climate dramaturg. Hi, Zoe. Hello. Joining me and Zoe today is James MacDonald. Morning. James is one of the UK's leading directors, regularly collaborating with the very best playwrights of this generation, including Carol Churchill, Lucy Kirkwood, Annie Baker, Mike Bartlett, the list goes on. And we're delighted to have him back at the Dolmar. We're also pleased to be speaking to Simone Ahiaku. Simone is a campaigner, geographer, writer and educator who has contributed to environmental, social and cultural work across the UK. Simone has worked on air pollution, divestment and climate justice campaigns and she currently uses facilitated workshops to explore climate colonialism and climate resistance. Hello. Hi, <laughs> thank you for joining us. And we're delighted to welcome back to Climate Conversations Fahana Yamin. Fahana is an internationally recognised environmental lawyer, climate change and development policy expert. She has advised leaders and ministers on climate negotiations for 30 years, representing small islands and developing countries, and attending nearly every major climate summit since 1991. Thank you all for joining us. Today we're thinking about Lucas Nath's play Doll's House Part 2, which is currently playing at the Donmar. We'll talk about living in a world of increased polarisation. What place does complexity have? Is it possible to hold more than one viewpoint at a time? And how does all of that relate to the ever-evolving climate crisis? James, may I start with you? I wonder if you could actually kick us off with a brief overview, a synopsis of Lucas's very smart play. Well, Doll's House Part 2 is about Nora Helmer from Doll's House Part 1 coming back to revisit her um, uh, husband and her family 15 years after she very famously slammed the door and um, walked out on her husband at the end of a long night of the soul. So Nora Helmer comes back and knocks on her own front door after 15 years away and she's had to come back because she's being pursued by a vengeful judge, a very Ibsen-y plot, uh, who's found out that she isn't um, divorced. In other words, she's been doing all kinds of things that a married woman in the culture of 1894, so 15 years after the doll's house, um, shouldn't be allowed to do. So she's in big, big trouble um, in the city in which she now lives, and the only way to resolve that, as she thinks at the time, is to come back and ask her husband to file a divorce, which, as she understood it, he was supposed to do 15 years ago, but he actually hasn't because he's had a kind of mini breakdown and he's still rather angry with her. So what Lucas has written is a, is a, is a four-handed play uh, with five big scenes in it which are like combats or debates between Nora and her husband ex-husband, as she'd like to think, uh, Nora and her daughter, who's the baby of the family, which she might rather avoid because she's terrified um, of the kids having uh, abandoned them, as it were, and Nora and the housekeeper who actually brought her up and then brought up her kids, whose name is Anne-Marie. That's brilliantly helpful, thank you, because it leads me to my next question, which I'd love for Hannah to pick up on. As James says, this play stages a series of conversations. There are effectively debates about values between those different characters that James has just described. I think those conversations are essentially a, a tussle between an old system and a need for a new one. How do you see that in relation to the climate crisis? Um, well, thank you for having me, and thank you for this brilliant series. And increasingly, we're seeing a really polarised world between haves and have-nots. Um, and I think there are many Noras today, maybe they're a bit younger, who are walking out on their families on the you know, traditional career paths and trying to create a very different world, a little bit like Nora did, mm. um, but also finding that very difficult. So I think some of the debates really crystallise you know, this tension where we are safest in our families and so we're able to 
bring our ideals, our hopes, our dreams, but at the same time we have to make massive asks of our families or our loved ones in order to change. Um, and so I think the play this time round brilliantly illustrates those set of dilemmas uh, and the huge asks um, and expectations that are involved on a personal level, on a family level, when you are trying to do system change. So the system that you know Nora was trying to dismantle was based around gender equality, what we would say is gender equality. But we now know that gender equality, you cannot achieve it within the existing economic system because that economic system itself is predicated on imperialism and a racially uh, uh, unjust division of labour between the global north and the global south, for example, between men and women that is so deeply rooted and deeply held that the whole thing needs to be toppled over. So yeah, there's, there's more complexity than even Nora imagined. And I think one of the things that really struck me was, you know, her saying repeatedly, it's just going to be another 20, 30 years. You know, she says that two or three times. And you just think, no, Nora, it's not going to be 20, 30 years before everything is, you know, really different. Yes, the dramatic irony of that really strikes home. Lucas knows what he's doing when he gives us those lines, doesn't he? Thank you. Simone, we're living in an era of extreme polarisation where it's hard to bring people into the same conversation. How does that connect with your experience as a climate activist? In so many ways, but thank you for having me. As a climate activist, you're trying to connect so many things for people and like trying to meet in the middle. So you are trying to, for example, connect with maybe the far right, even though like that's it's hard to say that as a climate activist because we don't necessarily do those conversations, but relating it to also other people who aren't necessarily awake to the movement, but are like interested in climate justice. It's difficult to kind of tackle kind of racism or gender inequality or disability justice without being able to see someone else's being. And like, it like heavily relates to the play when like Nora was saying to Two World that like, I didn't feel seen. I, you didn't see my humanity in this whole, Whole, our whole marriage, our whole time together. And I think that's why they were never able to have those conversations and meet in the middle. And it was really interesting to kind of see at the end that they finally had that conversation and he was finally willing to sit down with her and see and hear, listen to what she was actually saying. So I think like, yeah, reflecting on like being a climate activist, I think it's without being able to see how these systems prevent us from seeing each other, we're, we're not going to be able to meet in the middle and that requires us to do the work to unlearn these systems both within us as a as a personal thing but also as a collective and I think that's another aspect of like people aren't necessarily able to meet in the middle because like they they aren't able to see beyond their norm and they're not able to see what possibilities are out there for what the world could be and I think like at the moment we're facing the energy crisis we're facing racial capitalism we're facing you know e exploitation of like women across the world particularly in the global south and that's what we've always known so people aren't necessarily sure that like when we speak about climate justice those things are achievable it's like importantly climate justice is both practical and visionary work like doing this work is important for inspiring or instilling in people that like actually collective action works and actually collective visioning of what the world could be works um so yeah i think another aspect of it is that of meeting in the middle and trying to have those debates is that are people actually willing to see beyond their possibilities and see beyond their realities and accept that like another one could exist you know what that has come up quite a bit in conversation through this podcast series so far, but also through some of Zoe's wider research that she's, that she's facilitating here at the Don Meyer as we think about all of our theatre making practices and how they might relate to the climate crisis, which is that a failure of the imagination is the thing that is stopping us from picturing a more climate positive future and indeed a more socially just future. And these conversations begin to coalesce around the idea that that seems to be where theatre can help and be part of this conversation, that it can support a more active imagination and a place for better, healthier debate, I guess, in the case of Doll's House. I, I really want to ask, Simone, I want to jump off the back of what you've just said. Sure. As a climate activist, do you have any top tips for people to be better debaters, to be kinder listeners, to have conversations with people who you might in principle not agree with, but that you can have fruitful conversations with? I think a top tip is actually trying to meet people where they are. Being able to give them the information that they need to be able to learn 
about climate justice and social justice in a way that like suits them is one really important and also like having a sense of like compassion and empathy for the fact that like we were all there like I didn't wake up and be a climate activist or a climate campaigner I learned and I learned through tripping up all the time in organizing spaces and people within those organizing spaces being like hey let's have a conversation about that or hey let's build on your knowledge of this or hey read this thing and you'll like come back to me and like let's speak about this in like a group so I think like it's about yeah that like willingness to be compassionate about somebody's learning and allow them to kind of trip and I guess James I'm really curious to know during rehearsals whether some of what Simone's just said, um, but those skills of holding conversations with people you disagree with, how particularly given these characters, people who you've known and loved in the past, like what did you discover in the rehearsal room about how to have those conversations? Well, yes, it, it being a play, of course, you're trying to find the best argument you could make um, and what's the most you could upend what the other person just argued. So it's not necessarily the most sympathetic way of doing it. Um, in fact, very often far from it. But we did have lots of conversations about, OK, if they're making that argument, then why does this person move to this argument? And what's the best way to present that argument? Um, so it becomes a psychological thing about how you win arguments. Um, which, of course, involves lots of cultural questions about, you know, what's the argument you're trying to win and how much cultural baggage and history there is, particularly in family, about how you do win. Um, and those things go back to childhood, really, don't they? Um, how, you, how you win in a family setup, or how you're allowed to win if you're an old-school patriarchal um, husband and father. So, so we did talk about those things quite a lot because what Lucas has done in this play is, is um, you said earlier, is just strip it right back to debate or argument, which is his real MO as a playwright. It's what he does in all his plays and um, makes him, I think, in this moment, an incredibly important writer. God knows we need to learn how to argue properly in our culture. I wonder if you could describe, for those who weren't lucky enough to see the production, how you've also embodied that with Ray, your designer, in the design? Because I feel like the space you've created for those actors is one that is purely designed to allow debate. Yeah, well, that's exactly what we were trying to do. And um, Lucas wrote the play in quite a stripped-back way. But the history of the play has mostly been in proscenium theatres in America, including on Broadway. So um, it seemed to us that there was a little further that we could go by just making it completely in the round. So we fiddled around for ages to try and look at the best way of doing that. You know, given that the Don Mar is a room, it's, a, it's an old brewery and uh, banana ripening warehouse and rehearsal room so it's just a, it's just an open space which you can transform um, and it seemed to us that the less other stuff we had the better uh, coming out of lockdown I'm not I'm finding personally scenery a bit of a um, no no. A, a, a little bit too kind of cosmetic. So I'm interested in doing um, theatre, which is just about argument and about people in a space, really, and no more than that. So this felt like a great play to do that with. The other thing it's based on, which is maybe germane to this, it's a different uh, image, but Lucas had seen Marina Abramovich's show called The Artist is Present, um, which is happens in a completely neutral gallery space with just two chairs facing each other, in which a barometer which sits in one and the other one is um, filled by different members of the audience at any one time. So uh, we took that as a bit of an inspiration as well. And then we also thought we'd build a doll's house out of old bits of wood and have it on the stage at the beginning so that the audience didn't come in and um, see this new space straight away we just wanted to reveal it and so that's what we did. Oh, it's a very beautiful design I really admire the work that you and Ray Smith did on it. 
Zoe, I wonder if you could help bring some of these strands of conversation together and perhaps on this occasion help us think how theatre makers listening to this might apply some of this conversation to their own practice. What might it mean to make theatre today now? What James, you were saying just now about the kind of stripping back. We had that sort of moment of reckoning in the, in the pandemic where struggle as everybody was, people were finding ways through and finding other kinds of ways of being in the in the world and we sort of sped back to kind of business as usual and the kind of take make use lose model both in theatre and in the wider culture the sort of just in time model of like let's make this decision get this here whereas what James you're talking about I think and the way the doll's house feels is that that stripping back and that precision is a is a form of artistic rigor that actually is like it holds your attention absolutely for that for that time as you watch the kind of ping pong of the debate and everything that's on that stage is there for a reason and it allows a kind of architecture of recognition and, and focus so that you can really listen and there's something about that stripping back that both feels truer to the time we're actually in and in some ways therefore is almost comforting it's maybe a strange word for it but somehow recognizes that that, I mean, you know, specifically for theatre, that we can make great theatre out of not very much and it can feel transformative. But also that we, you know, you hear all the debates on the news and, and so on, and it all feels very loud and noisy, but not necessarily very clear. And there's something about the clarity of putting that particular set of questions on stage in a particular way. And like the purpose of this series, of course, is to kind of expand that out to the climate crisis. But actually, that's what's so brilliant about it is it's so precise that you go, ah, oh, there's this and it links to, you know, links to these big questions about system change. And how do you change the conversation when you're still, when the old system is still so powerful, as you were sort of saying earlier, Fana? This is relating to how I'm feeling. I have one debate in my head in the morning and another in the afternoon and I, you know, need times when I'm really feeling safe and wanting to be in the existing system and know it and it's familiar and it's, it's okay and I need to rest in it before I go out and sort of fight for this new world and find my comrades and friends and have that community and have that space where I'm more nurtured to, to imagine and create the, the new world, which is also simultaneously here, by the way, I think. And Nora shows that, you know, it is also there for her. She has achieved, she is free, she has lovers, she is doing fine, you know, even in that world, there is system change already happened, you know, for her. And tying it back to your question, what is the role of theatre? What is the role of imaginative spaces? That's why I'm here. I feel like there's a passionately, these are the spaces in which we can have some of those questions more safely than political parties. We certainly can't have them on the streets anymore. We're banned and, you know, imprisoned wherever you look, even in a country as safe as this. The space for protest has diminished. Um, and there's, there's a crucial need to connect to each other in a very human way. It ignited a certain kind of frustration that made me want to have a conversation afterwards, that made me want to argue with Nora about her individualism, actually, because you know, I, I also agree that we're, you know, we're porous beings. I don't think we can change without ha having relations with our, well, you know, she gets rid of the voices in her head that's the patriarchy, but she does it on her own. And it's like, well, what other voices are going to fill your head? I don't sort of believe in the sort of man is an island individual solo voice so much as I believe in that we network and relate to one another and discover other ways of being th through that and also that in terms of how we're going to keep managing and living and sometimes even thriving through this climate crisis it feels to me that community and relationships and that aren't just families you're born into but that you generate and make and what I love about it is it's not sentimental she still leaves again but she's leaving now after a, a moment in which they have heard and seen each other for a short while and I really liked at the end where like they still had that separation, but it was like they had seen each other. And I kind of see that in relation to like, when you're building these movements, we would hope for like long-term coalitions, but sometimes those things don't necessarily happen in the way that we'd like them to. And sometimes it's also okay for us to work on things in a short term, as long as we're able to see each other and know that like beyond our own personal movements and beyond like 
what we do as a together as a coalition there's a bigger picture of like if we don't do this together and we don't kind of see each other the future for all of us is doomed i think it's really useful to help us focus on coalitions actually and now thinking of nora and torvald forming their own sort of their own pact their own coalition at the end of the play their own agreement for a way forward even if it's not the beautiful ending that everyone hoped for. Yeah. I wonder, as we draw to a close, can I ask you all to think about what you'd invite our listeners to take away or to do differently after what they've heard in today's conversation? How can they be agents for positive change? I've been saying to everyone to, to become an activist in your own way, in your own community. Um, and I think that that's been one of the missing links. You know, it's either been all policy change or individual change, but actually we need a community as the bridge. It's that that middle layer, the tissue that has often been missing and you see it in this play as well. And it can't just be your blood family. In fact, it may be a different um, family, uh, a, a different kinship uh, network based on shared values. And how do we navigate, negotiate, work and create that family, create that community, which is missing for so many people. I think for me, it's to trial and fail in the presence of others. I think like it's important to be in, in groups, in kinship and coalition with people. I think that's the only way we all get to a place where we're able to try things and like experiment essentially. I think like campaigning is, is a test, is, and a series of failed experiments like or failed and successful experiments like you try one way it doesn't work you try lobbying you try direct action and one of the ways works or a myriad of ways works and I think the thing with especially with failure I think when we look at campaigns and like social movements we're looking we're always looking at like the black and white of like what was good what was bad and whilst those are important we don't leave space for the kind of gray area of like failures can be huge learnings I want to relate it to like Mariam Cabo who's like an abolitionist thinker and like activist and she says that we should do the work for our time and I think a lot of people kind of get caught up on like wanting to see the change the like system change in their lifetime and wanting to see a huge change that's like you know unfathomable for so many people and I think we can get so caught up on that we're kind of scared of our own individual actions or scared of our like small community actions towards affecting change and like it will definitely pay off for the next generation who don't necessarily have to do that work anymore they can continue to build on the visionary and like practical work that you've set out for them it makes me think uh, that debate in our particular historical, um, political, cultural moment could be far more of a tool than we ever managed to make it. And that that's something that we all need to learn to do better is just how to talk to each other and how to exchange differing opinions. Um, cause that's the thing that's really holding us back in the culture, both the, both the sorts of, um, infantile, three-word soundbite thing and the culture war thing and all of those aspects of, 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 of superficial political culture are militating against um, allowing us to talk to each other properly. And where it absolutely works, then I think theatre was invented to do that. I think that's what the Greeks were up to. They were inventing this thing which allowed people to express difficult ideas and give an audience space to digest them and to learn from them. And that's, that's, it would be a lovely thing if theatre could be central to the process of learning how to talk to each other better. I think it comes back to what I often say about it being tragic or epic. You know, it's not set, nothing is set in stone. You know, if we think of ourselves as tragic figures, then we are going to kind of go down in flames and take the planet with us because we can't re can't reimagine ourselves. But if we can think of ourselves in a more epic way, where when Nora walks out that door, she is walking into another future of another round of activism and change and new relations. And that's a sort of epic question where we don't know the answers we don't know what's going to be over the mountain or around the corner and we have to make our peace with the fact we'll never know but our our work will contribute in some way to that bigger picture i think we need the noras who are visionaries she's a visionary 
And often visionaries actually find it really hard to communicate and talk to others because they are so in their heads. She can see the world that she wants, but she cannot communicate and talk to others about it well. Uh, and it's often the job of others to do the weaving, the, the, the holding, the curation of spaces, the facilitation work that you're doing or the work that you're doing. So we have to ask less of our visionaries sometimes than we ask maybe of Nora. You know, Nora can't do all of that. We all have to do that work and we have to step up as um, the people who come next to translate and connect that vision and build coalitions. Brilliant. Thank you all very much. I'd love to thank our guests and indeed our listeners for joining our climate conversation today. Join us next time when we'll be talking about our following production, The Triumph.